All right. Um, good evening. First item is attendance. All council members are present with the exception of Ms. Cares, who informed us that she will be just a few minutes late, so we'll be seeing her shortly. Um, we have minutes to approve from March 4th. Are there any changes to those minutes? Seeing none, those will stand approved. Um, next item is the committee schedule. Uh, Ms. Raybine, if you could go through that, please. Certainly, let's see here. Uh, so the City Council Committees will be meeting on Wednesday, the 13th of March. And here we go, here's the schedule. Uh, Parks and Conservation will begin at 8.55 in the morning and go to 10.25. The Committee of the Whole will follow from 10.30 to 12.55. Land use and Planning will meet in the afternoon at 1 o'clock to 2.30 and administration and finance will follow from 2.35 to 3.05, and public works will round out the day from 3.10 to 3.40. And I think that the committee of the whole meeting, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, are you meeting here at council at chambers and then going off site or? No, we're just gonna meet off site. Um, so I will change the location of that meeting from council chambers to ATG corporate offices? Ms. Anderson. Okay. Um, yeah, that Center. would be the Cambium place at the Old Sawmill District. Correct. All right, we'll get that corrected on the committee schedule before we issue it um, finally tonight. All the other meetings, the Parks and Conservation, Land Use and Planning, Administration, Finance, and Public Works Committee meetings are being held right here in the Council Chambers at 140 West Pine. Thank you. Any changes to the committee schedule? All right, we'll move on to public comment. Uh, this is an opportunity to comment on items that are not elsewhere on the agenda. Uh, and if you could please keep your comments to approximately three minutes. Uh, give that, give the button a press there and see. Good evening. That's better. All right. Uh, Ryan Pillsbury, Ward 1. Um, I'm reaching out to the council today um, to request assistance with um, organizing a community cleanup day for the large amount of trash that has been blown out of the Missoula landfill and has um, really negatively impacted the interstate corridor uh, directly beneath it. I uh, was reading an article this morning by uh, Lauren Lindquist, the environmental writer for the Missoula Current, it had been posted to Facebook. I mistakenly, perhaps, uh, replied to that. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in a negative uh, feedback on Facebook. And uh, the, the substance of my conversation was, what, can the, what is the community doing to clean that up? Um, Ms. Linguist addresses in the article that the uh, Opportunity Resources has a contract to clean up within Republic Services area. Um, however, they do not address the um, trash that's been blown into the MDT corridor uh, between the interstate and that fence. Um, and so I think I send a general email out to the entire council. Thank you to Councilors Ramos, uh, Jones, and Merritt for your replies and helpful feedback. Um, to your points and concerns, Councilor Jones, with the uh, um, access to MDT, I did reach out to Shane Stack for your uh, recommendation. I'm awaiting a response. But um, I know MDT does have a protocol for safe trash collection through the Adopt a Highway program. That area is not adoptable, so this would require uh, special consideration for access from the community. And um, you know, the, this organization hinges entirely on that special consideration. Uh, further, I did reach out to uh, Laura Lindquist uh, about uh, the writer of that article. She uh, had some concerns about any cleanup neg negatively impacting the contract that OP has or Opportunity Resources has with uh, Republic Services. I reached out to uh, Clint Garner, who is the outgoing coordinator for the crew on that contract. Um, due to the unprecedented amount of trash that was blown out through the wind events, um, he said that the uh, community support would be welcomed. Um, now that would uh, be dependent on 
Republic Service is allowing the community to access their property. Um, I've reached out to Jim Keeney with Republic. I've left a voicemail, I've not heard back from him. So at this point, I think focusing on the MTT corridor would be um, maybe the most expedient. So I think there's uh, some public interest in this. I, I believe uh, some other people have reached out to the council about this. And this is a solution for the complaints that people put out on Facebook about what's being done. There could be an opportunity to, for people to come together and uh, you know, help uh, clean up the hillside that we all have to look at. And um, that's all I've got. Is there any uh, questions or comments from the council? We don't do uh, questions and stuff during the public comment period, but I will tell you that um, Julie Merritt, uh, I think, has uh, volunteered to act as point on this from council perspective. She's nodding, so I don't believe I'm speaking there. And I know I saw some email correspondence that county health is involved as well. So my recommendation, thanks very much for your interest in it and all the uh, that you've accomplished in just a short period of time, and I would recommend following up with Julie. Well, thank you. I will. Um, thank you all, council, for your time. Thanks. Any additional public comment? My name is Bob, uh, Bob Moore. I again bring up a... Hey, Bob, up. Mr. Moore, can you make sure that mic is down by your... Yeah, and it, is it on? Was that guy taller than me? <laughs> Just a touch. Um, Missoula Redevelopment Agency, I ask again that the council terminate the MRA and all of its functions and give all the money that you plan to give away to whoever, give it back to the taxpayers. An article, this is sort of a repeat, concerning the uh, hotel. I think the city of Missoula is very lucky to have the strength, the leadership of a gentleman like John. The hotel received $3.59 million in tax increment financing from the Missoula Redevelopment Agency. The money will be paid back. Money will be paid back. So I guess that means it's coming from the taxpayers. If it's somebody else, would somebody let me know if it's not being paid back to the taxpayers? Which it's not, but that's what it says. They're creating jobs and investment in Missoula, and we wouldn't be here today, uh, Andy said. Totally false. Got nothing to do with the $3.6 million that the taxpayers gave Andy uh, as part of his $42 million project for the hotel. This is from Martin Kit Kiston. Hotel represents 42 million investment in the heart of downtown, of which 3.6 million will be reimbursed using public funding. I guess public funding means the taxpayers. It's not some place in the wind coming from the MRA. Downtown advocates, well, I'll skip to it. That wasn't lost on members of the council during Wednesday's discussion. These were jobs that otherwise would not be there, said council member Heather Hart. That's a crucial piece of this whole idea of a redevelopment agency. When we have the ability in our position to affect people at their own level, we're doing the right work. Those jobs and investments would be still sitting there on Higgins with people going to work based on the 42 millions from Andy. Didn't need the 3.6 million from taxpayers. Didn't need it. The jobs are there because of Andy, not because of the MRA. And the MRA wants to make everybody believe that for goodness, if the MOA wasn't here handing out handouts, uh, we wouldn't have any jobs, probably. Nonsense. 
Andy says, it wouldn't have been done without the MRA. All he is doing is trying to butter up the mayor and the city council and the MRA so he can get a handout on his next hotel. It's going to be an autograph hotel, which are really, really nice hotels. If you don't think it will be done without the MRA, he is the same minutes of the MRA that says where he stated to me that the project would be done and I think without we're about any money from MRA. And we're at about four minutes, Mr. Moore. Oh, I don't want it to exceed my three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? My name is Brandon Wasser. I'd like to elaborate and just uh, add to the first man's comments about the trash. Now in the 15 years that I've lived in this valley, I've never seen so much trash blown out of the landfill, nor in the 25 years that I've lived within 30 miles of here. To me, this highlights a huge responsibility upon the city to enact some sort of recycling plan, some sort of program that will keep some of that plastic, if not all of it, from getting to the wind blown landfill in the first place. So with the city implementing this zero waste initiative, it seems to me that this provides a great opportunity and a great eyesore for everyone to realize that recycling, especially plastic recycling, is something that's worth investing in in Missoula. Now I already know that there's an organization called Precious Plastics that has an office in Missoula and they're trying to raise funds in order to build a plastic recycling facility. Now they just had a GoFundMe campaign that they shut off because they weren't getting any donations and they were only asking for $5,000. Now it seems to me that whatever the cost is going to be to have opportunity resources, if that's who it is, clean up that mess, it's going to take a lot of labor, a lot of time, and a lot of money to pay for that. It seems to me that investing maybe five or even $10,000 into a plastic recycling facility in Missoula one that is already operate or are already ready to be operational and already established as a reputable plastic recycling company. This seems to me like this is something that needs to happen. And I would like to ask the council to strongly consider making this recycling of plastic a first priority in the zero waste initiative. That's all I have. Thanks. Any additional public comment? All right, seeing none, we will move on to the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda were approved in city council committees by unanimous vote. We save time at council meetings by voting on these items as a package. The city clerk will read the list aloud, so citizens watching on MCAT will know what is on the consent agenda, and we'll invite community comment on these items before we vote. Ms. Rabine. Thanks. Tonight's consent agenda has 10 items. As always, the first is to prove claims. Claims are the city's accounts payable for the week. And this week they total $545,231.09 and the checks are dated tomorrow, March 12, 2019. Number two is to set a public hearing on March 25th. Uh, it's actually on March 18th, I believe. Um, and is the plan correct. is to try to continue it to March 25th. But the committee um, made the motion for the 25th, so that's why it's on the agenda this way. But we're looking at setting the public hearing on March 18th to adopt a resolution to rescind resolution number 4765 um, and remove the barrier in the alley between behind 2413 South Higgins Avenue or optionally adopt a resolution to supersede resolution 4765 and relocate the barrier in the alley behind that address, the 2413 South Higgins Avenue. I think that's the former Hoagieville location for anybody who's trying to figure that out. Or optionally direct staff to pursue an alternative course of action. So basically there's three um, options with respect to the barrier in the alley. Um, number three is to approve and authorize the mayor to sign a safety improvements construction and maintenance agreement with Montana Department of Transportation uh, for delineator post installation on Rogers Street and Cemetery Road and on Lower Miller Creek Road. Um, delineators are those reflectors, highway reflectors. I had to look that up. 
Um, number four is to award the bid for construction services on Grant Street and Harve Avenue for water main replacement project. Um, that project is being awarded to First Mark Construction in an amount not to exceed $467,855 and authorize the return of bid bonds. <coughs> Number five is to approve a waiver from uh, Missoula Municipal Code, Chapter 9.30, that's entitled Noise Control. Uh, for Dick Anderson Construction, a general contractor for the Montana Department of Transportation, uh, for nighttime paving on Russell Street from Broad way to third street number six is to confirm the mayor's reappointment of melanie brock to the missouri development agency board for term that commences may 1st 2019 and expires on april 30th of 2023 number seven is to approve a payment of the invoice from standard and poorest financial services in the amount of fifty three thousand dollars for performing a credit review on the city's water utility number eight is to approve a reimbursement agreement between stockman bank of Missoula, or excuse me, of Montana and the City of Missoula and the Missoula Redevelopment Agency, governing reimbursement to Stockman Bank of Montana for the eligible costs as identified under state law 7-5-42 incurred for the design and construction of a six-story office building consisting of Stockman Bank, leasable office space, and a two-story parking deck on the corner of Orange Street and Broadway. Uh, including deconstruction and demolition, environmental re remediation, utility relocations, and right-of-way improvements, and setting out the terms of the conditions of the agreement. Second part of this one is to adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of 1,529,318 subordinate lien tax increment urban renewal revenue notes um, from the riverfront Triangle Urban Renewal District Series 2019 to pay or reimburse the cost of certain improvements undertaken in, construct, in connection with an urban renewal project, prescribing the form and terms thereof and the security therefore. Um, that's to do also with that Stockman Bank. Uh, number nine is to confirm the mayor's appointment of Wendy Nintman to the Parks and Recreation Board with a term that begins immediately and expires on April 30th of 2022. Number 10 is to confirm uh, Daniel Gunlock to the Open Space Advisory Committee for a term that begins March 12th, 2019 and ends on January 25th of 2022. Thank you, and just for clarity, I just want everybody to be clear that on item two, the date is March 18th. Um, and that was the date that was moved out of committee. So the agenda reads the 25th, but as Marty spoke to, it's it's the 18th. Um, I'll take public comment on the consent agenda. I object to the reappointment of Melanie Brock to the Missoula Redevelopment Agency. Absolutely nothing to do with her. It's just a liberal organization that thinks we ought to spend taxpayers' money for various reasons. And I'm also opposed to the million five being paid on behalf of the Stockman Bank, as the Stockman Bank has uh, over $2 billion in assets, over $300 million in surplus. They can build their own building. Thank you. Any additional public comment on the consent agenda? Is there any council, or any council questions or comments? Jesse? Sorry, Mr. Ramos. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> At the risk of, of sounding too much like Mr. Moore, I, I too wanted to oppose those, um, th those two items that were mentioned, um, the reappointment of Melanie Brock and um, the $1.5 to Stockman Bank. I, I know that we had a great discussion about these in committee, um, but just to reiterate, um, the, the $1.5 to Stockman Bank, again, I, I'm a big fan of Stockman Bank. I actually bank there. Um, and I, I know Bill Coffey, the owner, is a great guy, um, but at the same time, you look at this $30 million building, and um, it was even mentioned in committee that um, the building would have happened um, no matter what, so we can't use the but for argument with this particular project. Um, we did have um, a couple of, of additional improvements that happened as a result of this extra money, but again, I, I, I think that there's other priorities that, that we should focus on, and I think that we could focus on if we didn't have those districts and, and that particular district that's extended out for so many years. 
Um, and I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that, again, $30 million plus building, um, the, the owner of it is, is one of the largest landowners in, in the state. And I think that they could, could afford their own improvements. Um, I, and I, I've been trying to pinpoint why, what it is about the MRA that, that I'm, I'm so, so distasteful about it, other than the, the, the items that I've already brought up many times before the committee. But I, I kind of liken it to our own Federal Reserve, and, and I definitely hate the Federal Reserve. But I think that the MRA kind of acts as Missoula's own little Federal Reserve in a way. They issue debt. They pick winners and losers. They um, choose to give some businesses some help and other businesses not. And, and I think that that is a big concern for me. And that kind of is a good segue into why I cannot appro uh, approve um, the appointment of Ms. Brock uh, for another term on the MRA board. Again, uh, nothing to do with, with her. I, I like her. I know her. I consider her a friend. Great person. But um, and, and I'm glad that you brought this up in committee, uh, Mr. President, that um, the city council does have uh, control over uh, projects that are bonded within MRA. And that's an important clarification to make. Um, but at the same time, there's also a lot of control that the MRA board has um, with money that, that's just tax increment that doesn't need council approval. And uh, the folks on MRA on the board are not appointed or they're not elected by the voters. They're appointed um, by the mayor and approved by the city council. And I do think that um, if, if um, me not liking the direction of the MRA and me being concerned about some of that stuff isn't a, a good reason to vote against um, her appointment that I don't know what is. Um, I vote for every one of um, the mayor's appointments to other boards and commissions because I, I believe that that is uh, his right as an executive. But I think that when there's millions of dollars of, of tax dollars being decided um, by folks that are not appointed uh, or not elected by the city uh, citizens, that we have to be uh, have extra scrutiny. And I do think that autonomy and independence is is important as well. And um, the fact that uh, Ms. Brock ran the mayor's re-election campaign, I do think is troubling. Um, don't get me wrong, if I was the mayor, I, I'd want something like that too on, on, the, on the MRA board, but um, unfortunately I cannot support uh, her appointment or the 1.5 million to Stockman Bank. And again, a lot of this stuff was, have, uh, was decided before I was already on council, so um, I kind of feel bad. Um, the developer thought they were getting one thing, but I, I think it'll pass anyways, but I cannot oppose, uh, uh, approve uh, those two things, so thank you. Is that a request to separate the question for six and eight? I apologize, yeah, six and eight. That was pretty clear. Uh, further, Ms. Merritt. Um, I would just like to speak uh, briefly to item number eight, the approval of a reimbursement agreement for Stockman Bank. I, I would like to point out that this is not money that's getting paid to um, Stockman Bank directly. It's not lining their pockets. This is a reimbursement of work that has already been completed. It's work that was over and above what was required of this developer. And um, that if we chose at this point in time not to pay this money, that we would be uh, basically reneging on an agreement that we had signed with this developer. And if, if the city of Missoula did that on a regular basis, it would be pretty damaging to our reputa reputation and no contractors would ever want to work with us at all. Um, I, the specific items that were over and above what the contractor was or what the developer was required in, did include deconstructing the building. And that saved literally tons of material from going to our landfill. Uh, which is kind of a poignant uh, item, given the public comment that we just heard. Um, it also um, allowed uh, Davis Bacon wages to be paid to the workers that were involved with the, the money that the MRA paid. And what that means is that additional, um, that those workers get paid more than average. And that's one of the very few ways that we as a city have to affect wages that private contractors pay in our city. We have very few tools that allow us to have any um, involvement with that. But anything that has MRA money attached to it, the contractor's required to pay those Davis-Bacon wages. And I just think that that's really important. This money is not while Stockman Bank becomes the funnel that it goes through, it is not going to line the pockets of the owners and um, you know the CEO and the vice president or whatever at Stockman Bank. Um, it is going to the infrastructure that you see on the street corner 
and um, having the construction done in a way that we have some control over. Thanks. Ms. West. On an entirely lighter note on um, item number eight, uh, the deconstruction of the building that used to be there. My husband is at this very moment turning some of those boards into stair treads. Um, so that's an exciting uh, use of um, MRA funds to um, prolong the life cycle of building materials that can't even be found anymore these days. Uh, Ms. Jones. I just wanted to shortly and succinctly say that I disagree with everything Mr. Ramos said, and I think our MRA structure is what gives us the ability to make some long-term plans and not be short-sighted, and it's an incredibly value, valuable tool that we have compared to most communities who have many other tools. So we've all discussed this many times before in this arena. It's nothing new, but um, I just wanted to clarify my situation and my position on this. Thanks. Um, I was going to ask Ms. Buchanan, since she's in the audience, to come up. It was represented that uh, Stockman somehow doesn't meet the, the but-for test. I think that's entirely false, but I think Ms. Merritt has already covered that. Uh, I know another item that came up um, that satisfies that requirement or that test is the um, uh, undergrounding of the utilities in the alleyway. This is not something that we require folks to do as part of development, nor is it appropriate to uh, ask one developer to uh, to shoulder that burden. It benefits the community and uh, additional economic development. I happen to comment on it in the article um, uh, during committees because I had just seen uh, an activated alleyway in a recent trip to DC where there was a, a really thriving pedestrian corridor and coffee shop, um, and that was another element to uh, utility uh, undergrounding in the in the alleyway there, and it was also an element of the um, the um, Merck project as well. So I think we've covered it. Uh, I don't. I want to ask you to come up, um, Mr. Dabari. I try to go last in this sound, but go ahead. I just wanted to speak in favor of Ms. Brock. Uh, in the interactions I've had with her over the years, um, as a member of the MRI board, I've always thought that she was incredibly thoughtful and committed to the general development of our community and enhancement of our community for the folks that live here. Uh, folks may disagree with how they spend their money, but I think it is safe to say that the rewards of spending that money can be plainly seen in the downtown and other places in our community, and uh, I will continue to support Ms. Brock's participation. Thanks. Um, all right, we will now have a vote, and we're going to separate. Um, sounds like we could do six and eight together, Ms. Ramos. So items six and eight, and then the balance of the items, Ms. Raymond. Okay, <clears throat> on consent agenda items number six and eight, that's the appointment of Ms. Brock and the reimbursement agreement and resolution with Stockman Bank. We'll start roll with Anderson. Yes. Anderson votes yes. Armstrong. Armstrong votes yes. Becerra. Yes. Becerra votes yes. Cares. Yes. Cares votes yes. Dabari. Dabari votes yes. Harp. Yes. Harp votes yes. Hess. Yes. Hess votes yes. Jones. Jones votes yes. Merritt. Yes. Merritt votes yes. Ramos. Ramos votes no. Von Losberg. Yes. Von Losberg votes yes. And West. West votes yes. Would any of you like to change your vote? Um, the total is 11 ayes and one nay. And on the balance of the items. Okay, that item passes. And on the remaining items on the consent agenda, Armstrong. Armstrong votes yes. Becerra. Becerra votes yes. Cares. Cares votes yes. Dabari. Dabari votes yes. Harp. Harp votes yes. Hess. Hess votes yes. Jones. Jones votes yes. Merritt. Merritt votes yes. Ramos. Ramos votes yes. Von Losberg. Yes. Von Losberg votes yes. West. West votes yes. And Anderson. Anderson votes yes. That's 12 eyes. Good time for me to note that Ms. Cares is here since she just voted twice. <laughs> Next item is comments from city staff, agencies, boards, commissions, authorities, and the community forum. And I believe we have a Lewis and Clark Neighborhood Council report from Mr. Westfall. Mr. 
President and City Council members, good evening. Thank you. Um, my name is Dave Westfall, and I am the co-chair of the Lewis and Clark Neighborhood Council. Last Wednesday evening, our council conducted its first general meeting of 2019 at the Community Center on South Higgins. Uh, in attendance were over 30 neighbors, six guest speakers, and seven members of the council. Um, Terry Connor, our co-chair, moderated the meeting, and after introducing the council members, uh, welcomed Mike Painter from Neighborhood Watch. Uh, Mike, as always, made a very engaging presentation, and we had at least seven people sign in that were interested in the Neighborhood Watch program. Next to speak was Morgan Valiant from the Missoula Parks and Recreation Department. As you may know, one of our neighborhood uh, top priorities in Lewis and Clark, uh, identified at the September 2017 general meeting as the health and welfare or the state of the Bancroft Ponds wildlife habitat. Just over a year ago, we established a steering committee that included Morgan Valiant, myself. Uh, Morgan's been instrumental in helping to guide our efforts and also we included representatives from the National Wildlife Foundation, uh, Clark Fork Coalition, Lewis and Clark Elementary School, and local neighbors. Uh, we meet mostly every month, uh, and I'm pleased to say that we're making good progress. Last summer, we had a major cleanup effort uh, in June. We've added signs at the three major entrances, posting feeding rules and pet responsibility uh, responsibilities, and finally, one large Bancroft Park sign at the corner of 34th and Bancroft. This summer, we plan to supplement those uh, with You Are Here location maps with brief descriptions of the various areas throughout the park. Our next steps include the improvement of a large portion of the trail system by adding hard-packed gravel to smooth the surface, making it ADA accessible, safer for joggers, bikers, walkers of all ages. Uh, this is being funded by a large neighborhood grant. It is scheduled for mid or late April or early May. Let's see how the Missoula weather treats us. We'll, we'll find out shortly. Uh, next is a spring cleanup project. This is held in cooperation uh, yearly with the United Way. It's scheduled for the summer solstice on June 21st, the longest day of the year, so we can work extra long, as well as a full tree planting uh, project to take place in September. Finally, the Five Valleys Audubon chapter in Missoula has agreed to provide a large donation to establish a bird habitat in the southwest corner of the park. These funds will go to the purchase of native trees, bushes, plants, and grasses that provide both food and shelter to resident, resident and migrating birds. Again, all this being done in cooperation with Parks and Recs. We then heard from Ben Weiss with the Bicycle and Pedestrian Office with the city and also Jeff Miller, a local neighbor. Traffic safety, in particular near and around Sentinel High School, has also been identified as a top concern in our neighborhood. Ben and the council have been considering the benefits of traffic calming circles in this area near Sentinel High School. Uh, and the associated costs and the process involved. Jeff Miller came into this. He presented a, a detailed analysis of the data that was supplied by uh, Ben, who they've been working uh, quite closely together over the last few months. And the, the data was in regard to accidents, locations, and severity from a 10-year period from 2007 to 2017. It was met with resounding applause. Uh, the people were very happy to hear the level of work um, that had went into it. Okay? Um, the current ADA requirements for curbs and sidewalks and street crossings and the costs associated with this calming circles is somewhat clouded, however. And so um, we have sort of just come to a point where we need to grapple with and wrestle with what our next steps are. Uh, we then had Ted Fuller, the principal of Sentinel High School, uh, who came, uh, came to give a comprehensive update on the improvements funded by the recent bonds, highlighting a new, more open, and safer main entrance to Sentinel High, 
the new performing arts facility and renovated theater, uh, the automotive technology education program, the STEM facility, student commons, and the library renovation. Finally, the solar array for visibility and as a teaching resource as well. Finally, both of our Ward 4 City Council members, John Debari, thank you, and Jesse Ramos, thank you, fielded questions from the neighbors. It was spirited, but never antagonistic, and it lasted quite a while. So all in all, we had a very productive and well-attended general meeting. Mr. President, Council members, thank you for your time this evening. Thanks very much, Mr. Westfall. Appreciate it. All right, we will move on to the public hearing section of the agenda, state law and city council rules, set guidelines for inviting community comment in a formal way on certain issues. Following a staff report on each item, the city council and the mayor invite community comment. City council, <coughs> excuse me, normally votes on the same night as a public hearing unless one council member requests that it be returned to a city council committee for further consideration. We have one public hearing this evening. Uh, Mike Haynes will provide the staff report and it is around ward boundaries uh, redistricting. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Mike Haynes. It's not the I dial. thought it was just my bad eyesight, but it looks better. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. So we are uh, here this evening to talk about uh, ward redistricting. This is the uh, final public hearing. So um, every two years in preparation for city elections, staff updates ward populations and proposes any changes that are needed to ward boundaries in order to uh, maintain practical equality of those wards in terms of population. And of course, every 10 years, we're able to adjust those uh, boundaries based on actual census data. In the interim years, ward boundaries are adjusted as needed based on estimated population growth in each ward, and that's derived from the building permits that are uh, issued in those two years, uh, and um, there's a calculation done as to the number of um, average number of people in each of those residential units. So um, this year, we're using residential building permits from 2017 and 2018 to estimate the new uh, city population. Um, most of that residential development over the last two years will be completed by the end of this year. So that does coincide nicely with the timing of the upcoming election and for ward representatives taking their seats in January 2020. So here is a quick uh, timeline of what we have uh, done in this respect over the past few years. Uh, 2011, uh, of course, was uh, the boundaries were adjusted based on the 2010 census. Uh, no changes were needed in 2013. Only minor changes were needed in 2015 to uh, Ward 1 and 2 boundaries. And of course, as we get further out from the census, then there is more uh, opportunity for deviation. So changes were made towards one, two, four, and six in 2017. And this year, changes are needed towards two, four, five, and six. Two years from now, there'll be the opportunity to adjust boundaries again based on the 2020 census. So uh, here's some... Uh, um, things that we have to keep in mind as we do these uh, um, redistricting uh, exercises. We need to maintain population of plus or minus 3% of the ward average. The intent is to keep ward boundaries regular and compact in shape and size. Use natural uh, physical geographic boundaries as far as possible, and that was not possible this year, and I'll, I'll touch upon that uh, later. Respect political and census boundaries where possible, and obviously uh, avoid redistricting a ward representative out of their seat. So here are the, is the map of current wards, and I would just uh, remind you that Ward 2 grew uh, substantially in terms of size anyway, based on the late 2018 annexation of the airport, the Missoula Development Park, and Canyon Creek Village. Uh, this is a graphical representation of the uh, permits that were issued over the last two years. 
It's showing you every permit that was issued, including for each uh, single family home that you can see there in the smallest dots and the larger dots represent uh, larger size projects. You can see that uh, there was a concentration of development that happened in, um, on Mullen Road, just west of Reserve in the um, Tullofsen and Altmullen apartment uh, complexes. There was also quite a bit of development in the old uh, sawmill district as well, and one or two significant projects around downtown. So when the math is done, the estimated population at the end of uh, 2018 was 76,383. Divide that by six, and that leaves you with a ward average of 12,731. The 3% that I mentioned earlier uh, is a variance of 382 people. So we need to, when we do this redistricting, each ward needs to be within the uh, parameters that you see there, a minimum of 12,349 and a maximum population of 13,113. So uh, there's a lot of information on this table, but I would draw your attention to, it's actually um, the third column, I think, it's the second on the screen here, but uh, over the past eight years, you can see um, pretty significant discrepancies in the, in the population change or the estimated population change over that time, all the way from 312 people in uh, Ward 4 to 4,400. Uh, and 19 people in Ward 2, so uh, that is why we need to do this uh, ward redistricting on a regular basis. And I would just remind you that Ward 2, 774 of that 1,892 uh, new population was generated by the annexation that I mentioned. So moving over to the uh, right-hand columns, you can see that uh, Wards uh, 3, 1 and 3 are still in alignment. Uh, wards four, five, and six are under uh, slightly from uh, where they need to be, and ward two is significantly over in terms of the estimated uh, population. So what we know when we did this analysis, if, we, if we're doing this in the, the most logical way possible, we know that we're maintaining uh, unchanged wards one and three. Obviously, what needs to happen, and I'm showing the, the sort of clockwise movement of what, happens, what had to happen with the ward boundaries, and that is ward um, uh, four and five needed to grow, ward six needed to grow in size, with the major change being ward six growing into uh, ward two, as you can see there on the map. Uh, talking about the meetings that we've held on this, we. Um, this was discussed at the Committee of the Whole on February 13th and February 20th. Uh, there were two options discussed, but the um, motion at uh, uh, Committee of the Whole was to consider only option one. So that's what we're bringing to you tonight. Uh, first reading at City Council of the uh, ordinance was on February 25th, and we are at the adoption public hearing tonight. So uh, specifically, here are the changes that we're uh, proposing. You can see that the changes are primarily here with the expansion of Ward 4 into Ward 5. Uh, and you can see here this is um, in the area just uh, eastern, uh, north and south of Brook Street. And you can also see in this location, this is where Ward 5 expanded into Ward 6. And this is in the, this is Dearborn, this is South Avenue. Uh, so those were the two uh, changes that happened in that, that location. And then finally, the significant change uh, was Ward six growing into Ward 2 in this location. And I mentioned physical barrier. We had used the river as a, um, as a barrier in the past, but uh, in this case, um, the only alternative was for Ward 6 to grow north of the river. And you can see there it's in the area south of Mullen, uh, Palmer and Broadway in general terms. 
So uh, this is the new ward map then with those um, changes uh, highlighted with the red circles. Um, obviously what this does is to bring the all six wards into alignment. You can see um, exactly what those changes uh, um, made in terms of the uh, changes in estimated population. And you can see, obviously, all six wards are within that 3% uh, th uh, variance. Um, there was, I think, a bit of discussion about what, of course, Ward 6 has grown into the Captain John Mullen uh, neighborhood as well as the west side. And um, so we provided a map here that shows uh, the fact that there are, that makes Ward 6 comprised of five wards. Um, but uh, there's uh, three Neighbor other wards that actually are comprised of more neighborhood councils. Neighborhood councils, yeah. Neighborhood councils. Um, so uh, with that, um, uh, our recommendation is to adopt an ordinance amending Title I, Chapter 1.16, entitled Election Wards, <coughs> revising and updating ward boundaries based on new population estimates. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Before I open the public hearing, are there any questions for Mike? Okay. Um, with that, I will open the public hearing. Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Um, and uh, this lives in Committee of the Whole. I've asked Ms. Jones, uh, since I'm presiding tonight, to make the motion. I'm just pulling up the motion so they have the... I've been looking at all of the graphs. Recommended motion is to adopt an ordinance amending Title I, Chapter 1.16, entitled Election Wards, Revising and Updating Ward Boundaries Based on New Population Statistics. And this was option one that was brought to us that we're referencing. Thanks, that's an order. Um, discussion on the motion, Ms. Mark. I just want to say thanks to Mike and his staff, and um, I know uh, President von Losberg, who also spent a great deal of time hemming and hawing over how to make this happen. So thank you all very much for all your hard work. Yes. Additional comment, discussion? Okay, with that, we've had a public hearing. We will have a roll call vote. Okay, on the ordinance, Becerra. Yes. Becerra votes yes, Cares. Cares votes yes, Dabari. Dabari votes yes, Harp. Harp votes yes, Hess, Hess votes yes, Jones, Jones votes yes, Merritt, Merritt votes yes, Ramos, Ramos votes yes, Von Losberg, yes. Von Losberg votes yes, West, West votes yes, Anderson, Anderson votes yes, and Armstrong, Armstrong votes yes. Would any of you like to change your vote? That's 12 eyes. Thank you. We will move on to communications from the mayor. I'm obviously sitting in for him this evening. I'll take the opportunity to um, let you know that uh, the Roxy Theater uh, got a wonderful grant this year to do science on screen. It's something that theaters across the country participate in. They're showing a number of um, different films uh, on that theme throughout the week. And it just so happens that uh, on Wednesday at 5 o'clock and Thursday at 3 o'clock, they're going to show the movie The Martian. It might be the case that I will get a chance to go down there. If you, if you come down, you'll get to hear me talk about uh, my involvement with some of the stuff in that movie. Uh, more importantly, you will also get to hear Jennifer Fowler, who's the Assistant Director, Montana Space Grant Director, Autonomous Aerial Systems uh, with the University of Montana. She's um, an impressive person. Um, we're going to do Q&A, uh, or a little presentation before the movie and then Q&A afterwards, but mostly I wanted to highlight that it's really wonderful for the Roxy uh, to have gotten this grant, and hopefully they'll be doing this in, in years ahead. And with that, where did, we go, where did you all start last week? We will start council comments with Ms. Armstrong. Pass. Mr. Dabari. I wanted to say that uh, the folks at the Lewis and Clark leadership team, along with Morgan, have done such a great job with their plans for Bancroft Pond. I was uh, really heartened to hear all of the work that they're planning to do there. So thanks, uh, Dave, for coming and reporting on that and all the work you've done. Ms. Jones. I had a couple of items. First of all, I wanted to congratulate um, Loyola Secret Heart Boys basketball team. It took 
place, second place in state. And congratulations to Hellgate High School girls basketball team that took third place in state, and the boys for Hellgate High School took second place. So um, it was a really fun basketball weekend. And congratulations, everyone. And on a separate topic, um, I wanted to um, address something. About a year and a half ago, uh, we spoke in council chambers about the fact that a 19-year-old firefighter died it was in August of 2018, fighting a fire um, right outside of Missoula. It was his second fire he ever served on, and he died when a branch fell on him. His name was Trenton Johnson, and I um, learned yesterday that Senator Sue Malik is bringing a, uh, a resolution to the uh, legislature to have I believe it's part of a highway up in the Sealy Swan. I'm not sure, though. Um, but Trenton spent a lot of time in the Sealy Swan Valley um, to have a highway, a section of highway named as a memorial highway for Trenton Johnson, which I think would be a wonderful thing to do to recognize him. So if you uh, have an opinion or support it, I would recommend you email Senator Sue Malik. Her, it's, her email is senatormalik at gmail.com, and her name is spelled M-A-L-E-K, and she's bringing it to committee this Wednesday. Thanks, Ms. Karras. Thank you. I have a series of comments I'd like to read uh, from the general manager of Republic Services, Glenda Bradshaw. Uh, so here I go. She says that uh, we've heard the various community comments on the blown trash from the various storms we had in February bookended by the significant wind event at the landfill last weekend. We have it handled and appreciate, though we appreciate the offers to help to clean it up, picking up trash along the hallway, highway is best left to our crew. We have a large crew from a temp agency as well as the regularly cr regular crew from Opportunity Resources on it. The scope and volume of the trash make it difficult to pinpoint exactly when we will have this completed, but we have half the highway on the landfill side cleaned up as of today. The other half will be done tomorrow or Wednesday. We're waiting to hear back from MDOT on how to best slash safely clean the center grass strip. We will likely hear about that tomorrow. I have asked my team to have it spotless by Friday. She goes on to talk about the various things and um, safety concerns that they have around the topic, but I think it's prudent and relevant to share uh, the timeline that they have, there, that being to clean that up by Friday. And I wanna thank the folks that came to public comment today, um, both for their interest and for staying to this point so that you could hear that response, because frequently folks who come for public comment leave and don't get to hear things like that. So uh, those are my comments, thank you. Ms. Bissar. Mr. Ramos. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> um, like Dr. Dabari, just wanted to echo his um, sentiments about the um, Lewis and Clark leadership team. You guys have done a great job. Um, wanted to give a shout out to, to Dave, of course, and um, Teresa. You guys have really brought that, that neighborhood council together. There was a, a great turnout, a lot of really engaged citizens that, that came and shared the concerns. And I want to thank Dr. Dabari for uh, helping me out with some of those questions. Um, we definitely feel it on for a while, and it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and wanted to, to do a quick shout out to a gentleman that was there, um, Jeff Miller, that actually was just a private citizen who um, heard some concerns about wanting some traffic circles and did an incredible amount of research on his own. I don't know how long it took him, probably four, 40, 50 hours, something like that, to put together a really detailed PowerPoint where he had all the traffic crashes, the, the cause of the accident, uh, who was involved, all pinpointed on a map, and did calculations as to what percentage they were, where they were in our ward, just based on um, police reports. So I thought that was really cool to see a citizen step up and volunteer his time to, to present that, and, and just wanted to do a shout out to Jeff. Thanks, Mr. Hess. Ms. West. Um, I just wanted to also um, follow up on uh, the public, or the, the trash comments. Um, I would recommend that folks uh, do tour the recycling center when they have the option. It's um, very enlightening, um, and there's a lot more thing, more, there are bigger issues outside of Missoula involved in the recycling market, and a big thing is that um, 
countries outside of the US no longer want to buy our trash. And I don't necessarily fault them for that. Um, and I think that we need to be focusing on front end as well as back end solutions. And part of that is um, knowing that we can't necessarily count on um, China or other um, countries to purchase our trash. Um, there needs to be some change on the front end on how we consume and what choices we make as consumers. And um, I, you know, seeing the impact on our own community of trash um, really brings that to the forefront of discussion. Um, and I also wanted to clarify that the, that I didn't just end up with <laughs> with wood from the uh, the former um, Coca Cola bottling plant, and then the Salvation Army uh, was there prior. Um, so I purchased that from Wasteless Works, which was the company that one of our three deconstruction companies in Missoula um, that. Uh, deconstruct um, buildings of all kinds. Um, and their uh, yard is right behind um, Bitterroots Gymnastics. So if your kids are in gymnastics and you need something to do for an hour, um, there are a lot of uh, hidden treasures in that, um, in that uh, yard. So thanks. Ms. Anderson. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to wish our colleague Mirja Becerra a happy birthday. Um, we're all lucky for her service and her friendship, and so on. I wish her happy birthday. Also, it's not urban legend. President von Losberg is actually a rocket scientist. Um, not anymore. So <laughs> I will be getting some delicious popcorn at the Roxy and joining you for your talk. And to uh, council members uh, Ramos and Dabari, I'm giving you some good constituents, so please take care of them. And I will try to do my best to uh, Miss Cares and Miss Merritt to take care of their constituents. But um, on after. All commentary aside, I do think that you know the recent uh, talk today of recycling and the story that was brought up really does highlight that it is up to us to just do small things. Um, it seems like a really big problem, but um, when you look at it that way, it seems overwhelming. But um, at the grocery store today, I was getting some apples and went to go grab a plastic bag and said, hey, I actually don't need the plastic bag to put the apples in my cart. Um, and it's just small things. And one of the things, I also want to call out the Missoula Interfaith Club Collaborative. They are trying to bring together um, some churches to do some glass recycling. My congregation, St. Paul's Lutheran, is a part of that. So I want to applaud um, individuals and community members to step up and do what they can. You know, we are only given one earth, and it is our responsibility to do what we can to take care of it in big and small ways. So I think that this was a timely reminder, and I want to um, just encourage you all to do the small and big things as you can. Ms. Harp. I just wanted to um, celebrate that we just completed our first ever Local Government Citizens Academy last week, Tuesday. We had 35 people uh, graduate for our, from that first academy, for, uh, and we had 100 applicants for those, that, those 35 slots. And uh, Gwen and I had the opportunity to meet with these folks week in, week out. And, um, at the, our final session was a budgeting exercise, which kind of was the culmination of after the previous seven weeks of constant barrage of information that uh, I think even here on council, we don't necessarily know, but we got to hear every department, well, the department heads that were able to speak, celebrate what they do. And some of those comments are just extraordinary in the fact that they asked for more homework they asked for us to go longer in the evenings, asked us to, instead of doing it eight weeks, how about 12, how about two sessions? These are now people who are highly engaged and, not, and, and hungry for more information and ready, Mr. Pillsbury, to help out in other ways. Mr. Westfall, we, have, we had a couple of, uh, I think three people from your uh, neighborhood council that were uh, very engaged folks and, um, I'm sure they're going to come find you at some point. So be prepared to give them something to do. Ms. Merritt. Uh, hopefully I will be bringing a gang of school children to the Thursday afternoon science on the screen and get to hear um, Mr. Von Losberg's talk. So, um, And I, I want to give a huge shout out to Gwen and Heather for putting together the Citizens Academy. I've heard from a number of participants um, just how 
interesting and engaging it was and how much more they feel connected to our community as a result of that. So I hope we can keep that going. Um, I also just want to uh, remind folks that tomorrow evening at Franklin School at 5.30 is uh, the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization is putting on the Community Safety Summit. Um, they have done excellent presentations in the past. They usually have some good interactive um, activities for folks to participate in and learn more about the process uh, that they're going through to try and improve traffic and pedestrian safety in our community. So that's 530 at Franklin Elementary School. Thanks. I was negligent not thanking Ms. Jones and Ms. Harp for the work with the Citizens Academy. So I add my thanks to them and um, Jane Kelly and staff who helped with that as well. Uh, we have no committee reports this evening under new business. Um, their most recent legislative update, which I believe is 3-1, uh, is on the city's website, unless there was one. I think that's the most recent one. Um, is there any discussion or comments around the legislative report? Ms. West. So um, I believe there's a hearing for um, SB 245, which is establishing uh, commercial property assess clean energy programs. Um, and it's a bill that I believe, according to our tracking system, that we are supporting. <laughs> um, and I was wondering if anyone else, um, if we could have our lobbyist speak in support of that tomorrow, possibly, or what other council members thought. Any discussion on that one? If not, my recommend. Uh, I was going to say to, to reach out um, uh, probably directly to the mayor and Jessica Miller uh, about that. Yeah. Apparently, Ms. Karras was going to say the same thing. So, yeah, otherwise known as PACE, right? That's the PACE legislation. Yeah. Any other items for discussion? Okay. Um, are there any additional items to be referred? Seeing none, uh, the administrative report and charter of accounts is attached. <laughs> little cell phone excitement and with that thank you very much for your attendance this evening and your service all we are adjourned <laughs> <laughs>